children of the King. Isn't it good to know God has washed us from our sins through Christ and made us kings and priests to God? Amen. So we may be nobodies here, but we're somebody's there. We're uh, not known yet, well known. We have nothing yet, we have everything. Everything belongs to us. Well, that's what the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 3.20. All things are yours. Whether it's Apollos or Cephas or Paul. Or things present or things to come. Everything belongs to you. You are Christ and Christ is God. So we're involved in a good thing. And thank God God has simplified everything for us. I rejoice in this. God can't lie and Satan can't tell the truth. That simplifies things. And Jesus can't lose and Satan can't win. He has a good thing to know these things. And the unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom and the righteous can't disinherit. That's good to know. And those remaining in Christ can't be lost. And those ignoring him can't be saved. See how he simplified things. Those that run the race will win. You can't run the race without finishing it. You can't fight the fight without winning it. That's the way it is. You can't believe and be ashamed. You can't call on the name of the Lord and not be saved. You can't drink and not be satisfied. You can't have joy and not be strong. This is the promises of the word of God. You can't resist the devil without him fleeing from you. You can't seek and not find. You can't knock and not be open. You can't ask and not receive. These are promises from our Lord Jesus Christ. So I rejoice in the utter simplicity of salvation. God said it, you believe it, and that settles the matter. And you can go to heaven while you're environed with heaven. God, so to speak, gives us heaven to go to heaven in. What a glad thing it is. Now the theme of this weekend meeting is Save yourselves from this wayward generation. I personally kind of like the uh, King James way of saying it. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. It means the same thing. The idea is this generation is headed the wrong way. It's going the wrong place. See, there's a broad road, but it leads to destruction. And we're to save ourselves from this untoward wayward generation. And if you don't save yourself from it, you won't be saved from it. Right. You've got to exert some effort to come away from it because it has a tremendous pull upon your spirit. Amen. Yeah. This world has a talk upon man's soul. It draws it downward. And so Peter, with many other words, he exhorted the people on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2 and verse 40. Save yourselves. Many other words. That's the summation of what he said. He went into it at length, no doubt. Save yourselves in this untoward generation. Jesus did something to get you safely from here to there. Now you invest your time and your effort to make sure he did not die in vain. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. The power of the resurrection. We want to focus on that. Last night we, we focused on dying with Jesus. And if you want to save yourself, from this wayward generation, you have got to die with Christ. Amen. If you do not die with Christ, there is no chance that you will get into heaven. It just is an utter impossibility. Amen. And you've got to die daily. Amen. You have to crucify the flesh. In fact, the scripture says in Galatians 5, 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. So you mean to yourself. If you haven't crucified your flesh, like you're not even in. If you have crucified your flesh, that is, if you refuse to let it dominate, if you refuse to let your lower nature, you have one, you know. If you refuse to let it dominate, that's a sign that you're in Christ. Now I want to focus on the power of the resurrection, that without resurrection power, you will not be able to save yourself from this untoward generation. It's just not a matter of making up your mind and sheer willpower and trying hard and read the Bible every day and just putting a lot of effort into it. It's more than that. You've got to have the power of God to do this. Amen. And thank God the power of God's available. In fact, it's such great power that we're going to read tonight that Paul prayed the church would have their eyes open up so they could see it. <laughs> not because he was stupid or because they were unwilling, but because the power is so great you can't see it if God doesn't help you yeah. to see it and comprehend it. In the center of the early church in Acts, the fourth chapter, when they began to encounter opposition from the world, persecution broke out against them. They didn't call a caucus and find out how they could tone the message down or seek a place in Arizona where they could run off and be safe. 
They got together and they prayed. They prayed to God. They said, God, Pontius Pilate and Herod and Caiaphas, the high priest, and the people and the Gentiles are gathered together against you and against your Christ to do whatever your hand determined beforehand to be done. And I said this, uh, threatenings are coming against us. Behold our threatenings, Lord. Listen to what people are saying and give us boldness to preach your word. Do that, Lord. Oh, I wish the church would pray for this today. I have never heard a prayer meeting at the North American or any other American say, God, give us boldness to preach the word. Never heard a prayer like that in any public assembly. I don't doubt there maybe has been one. I just wasn't there when it took place. But I think this is in order in our generation. And after they prayed this prayer, it says the house was shaken where they were sitting. I knew right away it wasn't one of our churches. <laughs> And they were all filled with the Spirit. <laughs> and they began to speak the Word of God. And Acts 4.33 says, With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Christ. And great grace was upon them all. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in a lot of churches that you have too and never been in a church that didn't need a lot of grace. I need a lot of grace. Yeah. You need a lot of grace. Yeah. And you have it right here in the Bible. That when the apostles with great power, that's great insight, great understanding, the Lord working with them. When they witnessed to a resurrected Christ, it pleased God so much he poured out great grace upon them. Amen. Great grace makes you equal to whatever situation you're in. Amen. It makes you equal to whatever challenge faces you. Amen. It makes you greater than the world, stronger <coughs> than the world, gladder than the world. It makes you equal to the situation you're in. Great grace is upon them all. So I figure... We ought to talk about the resurrection more. We ought to lift it up more. We ought to wait to Easter to talk about the resurrection. We're serving a risen Christ. He's raised every day. He's exalted every day. The truth of the matter is we haven't seen it like we really can see. There's a lot to be seen in the resurrection of Christ. Let's just review some great truths about the resurrection of Christ. And why it's associated with power. Peter said on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 30 and 31, that Jesus had been exalted to the right hand of God. Now that's as high as you can get. That's as much power as you can get. Some people are waiting for Jesus to get the power. Jesus has got the power. He's in the right hand of God. Now he said, Peter in a flash of insight remembered how David was promised that our son God would raise up someone to sit on his throne. And Peter said... When that promise was given, he was talking about the resurrection of Christ. That when Jesus was raised up and set at the right hand of God, he occupied the throne God promised David. He said it was a different kind of throne. It wasn't a military throne. It was a throne in devoted to saving people from this untoward generation. Amen. Jesus has been exalted, given power over all flesh. This is Acts, and this is John 17. To, he's been given power over all that's all humanity, so that he can give eternal life to everybody God gave him. Amen. That's in the Bible. Nobody should balk at that. Say, that's a good thought. God gave you to Jesus. Is that a good thought? Amen. In fact, Jesus said in John 6, 44 and 45, no man can come to me except the Father that has sent me dry. Amen. So if you came to Jesus, that's why you came. Don't sit back and try and speculate how does he do it and when did he do it and does, does he do it against your will and things like this. If you've been drawn to Jesus, it's because God was involved. So give him thanks and believe on Jesus and go on your way rejoicing. Don't let the theologians confuse you about things like this. Exalted to David's throne. That's the resurrection of Christ. Here's another truth about it. In Acts 5, 30 and 31, Peter said he'd been exalted to give repentance to Israel and our mission of sin. To give repentance. To give repentance. That's what it says. In any version you got, that's what it says. He's been exalted to give repentance. Wow. Right when the Cornelius was converted in his household, they all come into Christ. They reported it to the apostles and elders <coughs> and holy people of old. And in Acts 11, chapter it says that the people responded and said, God has given them repentance. See, Jesus has been exalted to give repentance. Amen. There in 2 Timothy 2, 26, Paul admonishes Timothy, don't strive. A servant of God must not strive. Don't be argumentative. But be gentle toward all men. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. 
if peradventure God will give them repentance. Amen. How about that? God gives repentance. Amen. You can pray for God to give repentance. If you find it difficult in your own heart to repent, you can ask God, God, help me repent. I've read in the Bible that Jesus has been exalted to give repentance. I want repentance. I want to turn towards you. I want to do it, and God will give you the strength to do what you have been convinced you must do. Amen. Give repentance. That's, that's associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. And the resurrection of Christ is proof that he's going to judge the world Amen. righteously. He's going to judge it in righteousness. That's what Acts 17, 30 says. God, at times of ignorance, that is, times when people didn't know God and were groping for God like this, the times of ignorance, God winked at. Because there hadn't been a lot of revelation given, he didn't expect a lot from people, but those days are over now. Now he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Because he's appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, and he's given assurance to all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Amen. So the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead means he's going to judge the world. That's one more piece of good news. Amen. Because we're in Christ. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our brother. He's our captain. The captain of our salvation. He's the author of our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. It starts with Jesus and ends with Jesus, and he's the one that's going to judge us. That's good news. Amen. He's going to judge people favorably that are in him. Those that have trusted in him and believed in him and received the atonement and received the reconciliation, it will go well with them when Jesus judges them. So that's good news. Yes. He's given you assurance he's raised him from the dead. And I like Romans 1 4 proclaims the resurrected Christ. He has been declared, <coughs> as declared by God, he's been declared to be the Son of God with power Amen. by the resurrection. The resurrection proves that Jesus is the Son of God with power or authority. What do you need from God? What do you need from God to get you from here to there? And there are only two places here and there. That's all there are. And there's only two times now and then. That's all there are. What do you need to get from here to there and now to then? Jesus has authority from God to give it to you. It makes no difference what it is. If you need joy, you need peace. You need understanding. You need strength. Whatever you need, meekness, faith, whatever it is, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth. There isn't any more. Amen. And he's been given it to assist you to make it safe to the other side. Amen. I look forward to disembarking to the other side. What a, <laughs> the angels carried Lazarus to Abraham's bosom, escorted him. Maybe some of the angels that sustained him when he was here, when things were against him, I don't know. But if angels carried him to Abraham's bosom, you can imagine now that Jesus has been exalted, what's going to happen with us? I'll be an entourage who will appear. Walk your spirit home. He's the Son of God with power. Don't you dare lack anything that you need. If you feel deficient, you feel like you need more, you have got a Savior that can get you there. You have got a Savior that can fill you with all joy and peace and believing. He can do that. Take you all the way. He was raised from the dead. Romans 4, 25 says, He was delivered up for our offenses, but he was raised for our justification. I like justification. Our people don't talk a lot about justification. Of course, the reason they don't is they don't know anything about it. People talk about what they know about. And when you know about justification, you start talking about it. Justified means the slate's clean. Not guilty is what it means. You know, it says to the Corinthians, he lists off some terrible, terrible sins. He says, don't let anyone deceive you. People that do these things aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. He mentions things like fornication, adultery, idolatry, homosexuality. And he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, such were some of you. Not anymore, you were. Right. Slaves clean. Yeah. See, you're an alcoholics anonymous. I'm not against alcoholics anonymous. It's just that you don't go far enough. They can't get you to heaven. They really can't. Amen. They talk about the supreme being and the superior power. Well, I have to know his name. I don't like to talk about the supreme being. Amen. Talk about it by name. But see, once you're an alcoholic to them, you're always an alcoholic. 
In fact, their entire approach to this problem is on that basis. It's the same with Addicts Anonymous. It's the same thing. Drug Addicts Anonymous. They teach that once you are, you always are. But in Christ, that's not the case. In Christ, once you were, now you're not. That's the way it is in Christ. That's justification. Amen. Justification takes the past, separates it from you so even God can't see it anymore. And the rest of your life, you spend trying not to see it either. And Satan, when he brings it up to you, and he will. He will dig around in your past and bring it up to you. And when he does, you need to go to Christ and say, remind me again that I have been justified, that Jesus was risen for my justification. Amen. That I might stand before God and God see no occasion of fault in me. Right. In fact, the scripture says, now to him that is able to keep you from falling. Hey, that's a piece of good news, isn't it? Amen. Nobody wants to fall. To him that is able to keep you from falling. This is Jude 24 and 25. And to present you before his presence faultless, faultless, with exceeding joy. That's the kind of God we have, the kind of Christ we have. Amen. Justification is that thorough. Raised by justification. That it free, he frees us from condemnation. His resurrection is associated with that. <laughs> Romans 8, chapter and verse 34 tells us that uh, Christ was uh, Christ delivered us from our sin, but he said, uh, who is he that condemns? Who is it? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather. Huh? Not many places in Scripture say that when you talk about Christ death. Yea, rather. Is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? So if anyone wants to condemn, let him stand for it. Amen. And when they're through, Jesus will speak thou, not guilty. Amen. Not guilty. All that's associated with the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now here's a word spoken to believers. Romans 10, 9, and 10 is generally quoted by the denominational world of sinners, people that aren't in Christ. If you will believe, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the text says. But it wasn't spoken to alien sinners, it was spoken to believers. Now believe me when I tell you the church needs to hear this. Amen. The church needs people, somebody somewhere to stand up and say, listen, if you will confess it, say it. Say it to your enemies. Say it to your brothers and sisters. Say it every place. I believe Jesus is Lord. Confess it. You confess something that's in here, you know. It comes out from your heart. From your heart, out your mouth, you confess him as Lord, and then believe in your heart, down there at the heart of your person. When you believe God raised him from the dead, God makes a pledge, and God can't lie, you'll be yeah. saved. That's what he said. Yeah. That means the resurrection is potent stuff. Yeah. God doesn't make commitments like that, folks. You will be saved on the basis of some kind of tribute. It's always very important. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 14. He said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain. We as well fold up our Bibles and go home. We're not preaching reform. We're not saying let's all be good neighbors. Oh, we're all for good neighbors. Don't get me wrong. We're not saying let's make sure all our families run along smoothly, although we're from that and we want that. But if Christ isn't risen from the dead, we don't have anything to preach. We don't have anything to say. The gospel we preach requires a risen Christ. Amen. It has to be a living, risen, dominating, influential Christ. And if it's not, Amen. we have nothing to say. But thank God he is risen from the dead, which Amen. means our preaching is not vain. Amen. It's not vain. It may look like it, but it's not. So when you come to preach God's word, you come to hear God's word, and a handful of people turn out. we got more than a handful tonight, thank God. Amen. But if a handful of people turn out, like so far. Amen. So what? The preaching's not vain. Amen. If two show up, it's still not vain. Amen. Our preaching's not vain because it's undergirded by a risen, ruling, reigning Christ. See, the resurrection of Christ is dominant. Or how about this? 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ is not risen from the dead, you're still in your sins. But see, he is risen from the dead. Which means you're not still in your sins. Good piece of those, isn't it? If the devil tries to throw your sin back on you, throw it off. Say, no, Jesus is risen from the dead, which means I'm not in my sin. Not anymore. Amen. And then I like this Peter. Insightful Peter, 1 Peter 1.21. He said, Christ 
is risen from the dead that your faith and hope might be in God. So that means your faith and hope in God is just not the result of your analytical powers. Yes. Like you read the Bible. Amen. You figured it all out. Huh? You use a little bit of your learning that you got in school or whatever and some good hard logic and you figured it all out. Well, no. <laughs> Jesus was risen from the dead so your faith could be in God. And so your hope could be in God. And you could read and study and dissect and analyze all you want. And if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead, you wouldn't know any more than the prophets old. Yeah. You'd be as dense and in the dark as Israel was. Well, see, Jesus is risen from the dead. He is at the right hand of God, which means that your faith and hope is in God is because of Him more than because of you. Amen. And so you give Him thanks for your faith. You have received like precious Amen. faith. And He's Amen. given you everlasting consolation, good hope, through grace. See, it came from a risen Christ. Amen. See, the resurrection of Christ is, is vital. How was Jesus raised from the dead? Now, this is something that does not cease to intrigue me. <clears throat> There are a number of views of scripture about how Christ is raised from the dead. I want to just touch on two of, two of them. One is found in John 10, 17 and 18. In this text, Jesus says, No man takes my life from me. Nobody does. I lay it down and I take it up again. Amen. He says, This is the commandment I receive from my Father. So when Jesus entered into the world, God gave him a commandment. It was not commandments. Commandment. What? Lay your life down. Voluntarily die. Do it of your own volition. And then when the appointed time comes, pick up your life and come back again. Amen. So he brought himself back from the dead. He took his life back again. Amen. Now there had never been anything like this before in the land. There have been resurrections of the dead before Jesus. A number of them. Let me just name, name some of them. Elisha, mighty prophet of God. He died. They put his, buried him. Some time passed. 2 Kings 13 tells us that a group of men were carrying a dead body. To bury this dead body. And some thieves come on these fellows and they got scared. They threw this dead body in this hole in the ground where Elisha's bones were. And this dead body hit Elisha's bones and the guy stood up alive. Well, that gets your attention now. I wonder, it just kind of hit there. I wondered what the thieves thought. <laughs> now this fellow come back to life, but he didn't bring himself back. He didn't take up his life himself. It was a great, a miraculous resurrection, but this man didn't take his life up. Somebody else brought him back. Or here was the Prophet Elijah, do you remember the widow's son died that he told her he was going to have, she was going to have? And he laid himself upon the child, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, feet to feet, the scripture says. And the child sneezed seven times. This is 2 Kings uh, 14, Prophet Elisha. Sneezed seven times and the, the lad spirit came into him again and he revived. Now this, but this boy didn't take up his life again. He was brought back from the dead. Or how about uh, Jairus' daughter? Here's a young lady, 12 years of age, that died. She hadn't been dead long at all. And Jesus came in, took her by the hand, told her to rise. She rose up. Resurrection. But she didn't come back herself. Jesus brought her back. It wasn't under her own power. Then there was a little old name. Remember her, her son. Now, her son was a little better than Jairus' daughter was. And they were carrying him on a pallet. And Jesus finds this funeral procession and he stops it and raises her boy from the dead. See, the widow and man's boy come back from the dead, but he didn't come back under his own power. He didn't take up his life himself. Jesus brought her back. And then there was Lazarus. He was deader than the other two. He was in the grave for four days. And Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave. He comes out. You know, I wondered how he got out of there because it says he was wrapped up head and foot. He was bound with grave clothes and napkin around his head. So he couldn't see, couldn't move. I got a big he hopped out. <laughs> got out of there, and the first thing he got out of there, Jesus said, loose him and let him go. That's kind of our commission for. Amen. See, Lazarus had good eyes, but he couldn't see. He had this, this uh, rag around his head. His muscles were all toned up, blood flowing good, but he couldn't move. He's bound in great clothes. Isn't that like a lot of church folk? Yes. Yes. 
I got something way down underneath here. There's something here, but they're all bound up with tradition and things like this. And our job, we'll soon let them go. If Elijah, he didn't come back under his own power. He didn't take up his life. Jesus gave it back to us. Uh, this is a little aside. I've often wondered how Lazarus felt about coming back from the other side. I mean, like it wasn't exactly a blessing, you know. Uh, I know that Jesus can still raise the dead, but when I die, I want to stay there. I don't want to come back. But if Jesus decides to bring me back, I suppose I'll be willing to work. But quite candidly, I must be honest with you, I think I'd rather stay on the other side. So I, I actually think Lazarus probably got an extra portion when he went back the second time. <laughs> got an extra portion. Because, uh, well, that was for our sakes that these things are written, you see. Incidentally, on those three deaths, you have Jairus' daughter, she's still, she's still pretty, just newly died. You have widow Nain's son, he wasn't quite so pretty. Then you have Lazarus, his mortification had set in, he became again to set in. But they were all three dead, and there's people like that today. There are people that look nice, but they're dead, like Jairus' daughter. And there are people that don't look too nice. You can kind of sense they're out of it. They're like the widow and angels, and they're something bottomed up. They're at the bottom of the barrel. They're like Lazarus. They stink. But really, there's no difference between all three of them. They don't need to be brought back. Amen. Now, once again, the different thing about Jesus was he took his life back himself. What authority that was. No <laughs> one moment did Satan volunteer to let him out of there. Amen. I wouldn't doubt but that all the evil spirits and the princes of darkness must have converged upon Jerusalem when Jesus died. To make sure that he's kept there. Satan's sense that if you could keep this personality there, humanity had no hope. But all we read is Jesus just took his life back and he came back. Yeah. Let captivity captive. He just yeah. come out of there and let the captives free. He bound the strong man. Yeah. Begin to distribute the goods to the people. Yes. That's our Lord Jesus. Yeah. Took his life back. There's another view of Christ's resurrection. It's an intriguing one. Romans 6, 4. Now, this is a verse we quote a lot for baptism. Unfortunately, generally people quoting this are trying to emphasize baptism and forget all about Jesus. And the point of baptism is to get you into Jesus. That's what it's all about. So I said that we are buried with Christ by baptism into death. The like as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the, by the, glory of the Father. Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Raised by the glory of the Father. What is the glory of the Father? Well, theologically, people would say, the glory of God is the sum total of his attributes. But, you know, no one knows what that means. <laughs> what it means is the evidence. It's the unquestionable evidence of the presence of God. Whenever God's glory is made known, in some sense, people became conscious of his presence there. Like Moses said to God, show me your glory. So what did God do? He himself passed before Moses, and he told Moses what he was like. That was his glory. He, Moses became aware of some facets of God that he had not considered, at least to that degree, before the glory of God, the unquestionable evidence of his presence. Now, when the glory of God is made known, it never confronts obstacles. Amen. There at Mount Sinai, when God's glory came down, the scripture says his feet touched the mountain. That's a way of saying this is a very reduced vision of God as compared to how much of God is revealed in Christ. At Sinai, under the law, just a very abbreviated introduction to God, but... <laughs> The, the Sinaitic Peninsula lit up with a glow and the earth shook and the place about fell apart. And when God was there, unquestionably there, his voice is booming like a trumpet. Nobody was dancing around a calf when that was going. <laughs> no one was committing a sexual immorality when that was going on. Whenever God's presence was unquestionably there, sin stopped and it stopped abruptly. See, it's only when people forget about God that they sin. Amen. It's only when they're unaware of God that they sin. Yes. You can't sin in the face of God. You can't do it. Amen. Now, when God's glory invaded the tomb, it was not possible he could be held by the pains of death. 
was not possible. He just came out of there by the glory of God. Amen. See, God is greater than Satan. Amen. See, light is greater than darkness. Righteousness is greater than, than sinfulness. Life is greater than death. So the way it is, and God's glory dispelled the powers of darkness. Nothing stands before God's glory. He was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even the soul. That means we're raised by the glory of the Father too. Amen. I admit it's on, a, it's on a reduced scale, but it's because our vessels are decidedly smaller. We're not able to contain what Jesus contained, but it's the same stuff that's in us, just not as much as was in him. We're raised by the glory of the Father. Amen. Suddenly, we become aware, more aware of God than of the world. Amen. More aware of forgiveness than we are of sin. We become more aware of Jesus than of the devil. And it enables us to rise from the dead. I like that. That's what happens in your baptism. You actually, you're different when you come up. Amen. You really are. So people that argue, you know, for, for a sprinkling and all of this sort of thing, see, they miss the whole point. Right. They miss the whole point. That's right. So I myself, just speak for myself, I don't go to the Greek to them to explain what baptizo means. I got to go to the gospel and explain what the gospel is. The gospel is Christ yeah. died and was buried. Yeah. He was buried. Yeah. And some stuff happened there when he was buried. He bore our sins away when he was buried. Yes. Gone. Then he rose from the dead. Now, whatever you think of baptism, the ordinance has to match the doctrine. Yes. Romans 6, 17 says it's the form of the doctrine. That's what baptism is. That's why we bury them, because there's a real death going on here, but God's going to raise, raise them from the dead. Glory to now, what were the results of Christ's resurrection? Like, what happened? What impact did it leave? To many, it appeared in the world like nothing happened. In fact, Jesus did not indiscriminately just appear to everybody when he was raised from the dead. He appeared to just select witnesses chosen before the scriptures. One time, he appeared to about 500 brethren at once. I'm anxious to talk to those brethren. Because 380 of them weren't there on the day of Pentecost. I wonder what happened to these people. 120. <laughs> 120 were there, and he appeared to over. Some were over 500 brethren at one time, and it must have, must have wore off or something. I wondered about that. So Jesus wanted to be known as a resurrected Christ on a different dimension than with the eyes and with the ears. Here's something that happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, there's a new dimension of spiritual power. When Jesus was here upon the earth, he raised people from the dead. He healed people that were blind. He unstopped deaf ears. He loosened dumb tongues. He made lame people walk. He healed the palsy and the dropsy. People with bent over backs. People with withered hands. He did all of these things. Multitudes. Sometimes you read in scripture, and they had, he healed them all. The utter magnitude of it boggles the mind. And there are some people still enamored with that kind of power. They think that's the greatest power there is. Now, it's great power. I don't deny this. And there are times when I want this power, too. In fact, I have a son here tonight that's a testimony of that kind of power. But that's not the greatest power. The greatest power is the power he received when he went back to heaven, not the power he received when he came to earth. Amen. See, you can go to heaven and be sick. We don't want you to, but some people do. Some people, like Elisha, die of a disease. It happens. But Jesus has been raised from the dead to produce a new dimension of power that will take you into the next world. Amen. He's declared to be the Son of God with that kind of power. Now here, here's the truth. It's found in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. It says, He has begotten us again. That means born again. He's begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So someone says, if you want to be born again, you want to be born again? Here you are. Sign this card. How people teach this? Sign this card. Come forward. Put down on the card here the date that you made your decision. Some people say, here you want to be saved. Here, here's what to do. Bow your head and repeat the sinner's prayer. If you like saying, which one? Repeat the sinner's prayer. Nobody in the Bible is ever saved by praying. Nobody. We are begotten again.
came to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, that's not by procedure. Amen. We were not born again by procedure. We were begotten again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what enabled us to be born again. So if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, it doesn't make any difference Amen. what you would do. Amen. But he is risen from the dead. And if you are born again, you'll give thanks to a risen Christ. Because if it wasn't Amen. for him, you wouldn't have been born again. Yes. Now here's something else about it, for the resurrection of Christ. That's what gives power to our baptisms. Yes. And I thank God that, I, that this is not a thing that I balk at, baptism. There are some people that just have an awful time with this. Even though there's not one bad word about baptism in the Bible, not even the Pharisees said anything about it. So I figure if someone has questions about it, they've really got to be on the bottom of the rung intellectually and spiritually. Because nobody questions the Bible. But the thing that gives power to your baptism is Christ's resurrection. Amen. Now this is taught in 1 Peter 3, 21. He first of all, he alludes to Noah, who was saved by water. I used to read that and say, saved by water? I mean, what? How was Noah saved by water? Well, the stuff that drowned everybody else made his boat float. Yes. That's how he was saved by water. Amen. Amen. Don't you know, what if, what if God had sent a fire from heaven? Well, the ark wouldn't have saved him. It would have, <laughs> have been burned up. What if he had sent a flood of a hail and fire along the ground? The ark wouldn't have saved him. Then what if he had sent locusts or lice? Or something like the ten plagues. What if he just said that? The ark wouldn't have saved him. But when he said water, that boat was made for water. It was made to survive water. It was made to survive a flood. He, and when you were baptized, <laughs> you survived the deluge. You Amen. come out alive. Amen. The light that you were into even baptism does now also save us. Now at this point I like uh, this version, not the putting away the filth of the flesh. Here's how the NIV reads, not the removal of dirt from of the body. I don't know where the world got that. That's, that's not in any kind of language at all. What he's saying is, he's not saying like take a bath. Our Lord does not draw similarities between great spiritual realities and mundane, everyday, earthly things. Not when it comes to this. What he's saying is that putting away the filth of the flesh was referring to Jewish ceremony. Yes. But there were washings, different kind of washings, washings of purification. But they really didn't make anybody clean. They were just a ceremony. That's all they were, were a ceremony. What he's saying, baptism is not just a ceremony. Amen. We're not saved by a ceremony. We are saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. If you like Christian baptism does not also save us. Then there's a parenthesis line. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer or appeal to God for a good conscience. Then he takes it up. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the sentence, without that little clarifier in there, is the light figure water does now also save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, that's good. Good truth. I think that needs to be preached. I think a lot of our denominational friends that haggle around about baptism have never really seen that connection. So maybe we can show that to them. <laughs> show them that it's connected with the resurrection Amen. of Jesus Christ. In fact, Colossians 2.12 says that we are buried with him by baptism and raised by faith in the operation of God. Amen. That's the work of God he's talking about, the divine work of God. So God performed the work. He took resurrection power and he gave it to you. So just as Jesus rose from the Amen. tomb, you rose through death and trespasses and sins. You come out of the ash heap of sin Amen. by the resurrection of Christ. I love that truth. Now the power of the resurrection. That's my introduction. Amen. <laughs> uh, I won't be much longer here. Amen. I don't. I don't think. Of course, these things you don't know all sometimes. Now <laughs> the power of the resurrection. This is such great power that God has to expand our understanding of it. Yes. Now this is taught in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 18 through 20. Uh, and I, I want to read this to you uh, out of the uh, New International Version. The King James says, I, I'm praying, verse 17 says, Since I heard of your faith and love that you have toward all saints, I've been praying.
that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding might be opened to see what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power to us with it believe. Now here it is again, everybody. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches, and point number two, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms. At that point, I like this other, which he wrought in Christ. The idea is what he did in Christ, that's, that's how the power has been employed. Yes. This power that he wants you to be able to see is the power that he employed in raising Jesus from the dead. Now, notice what Paul prays that their eyes, these are believers, that their eyes and their heart, that is so they can see the, the, ex, the, the uh, magnitude of these things. It isn't that they didn't know anything about them. It's that they were bigger than they, than they thought. They just seen some aspects of it. He said, open up to see what the hope of his calling is. Like, what is this all about? Why did God save us? Why did he save us? To make us happy here? Well, that's a byproduct. Thank God for it. But it's bigger than that. Why did he save us? So our marriages would work? That's a byproduct. Yes, we want that. But it's bigger than that. It's so big that you'll pass it by if God doesn't help you see it. Now, God can do this. See, he opened Lydia's heart. That's what Acts 16 says. He opened her heart. He can open the eyes of your heart. You go, oh, I never saw that before. It's, it's stuff that's in the Bible here. He's not going to help you see things that aren't written. He's going to help you. He's going to expand your understanding of what's written here. And to know what his glory of his inheritance is in the saints. In other words, salvation's what you got. You're what God got. Now some of may say, well, that's not a very good exchange. Listen, let me tell you something. God does not buy garbage. He's not in the garbage salvaging business and recycling garbage. That's not what this is about. Amen. This in here, you're what he, we're what God's getting, a people for his name. Amen. That's what Acts 15 says. Amen. He's calling out of the world a people for his name. And this is a big, good enterprise. Amen. He invested his son in it. He invested his spirit in it. His angels are discharged to minister for those who are the heirs of salvation. Amen. He himself is involved in it. And he's employed apostles and prophets to write scripture for us, to give us insight into these things. Amen. And it's a great, great enterprise. So he wants us to open up to see how great this is. So we can say, so we can come to him and say, Lord, we want to be pure for you. Yes. We want to be holy for you. Amen. We don't want to be contaminated. And if you don't want to be, you already know he doesn't want you to be. Amen. You already know that's all that remains is for you not want to be. And when you say, I don't want to be impure, God says, all right. I will now help you to be sanctified. That's what the scripture means. Separate. Separate it from the, from the world. And then he says, oh, you've got to see the exceeding greatness of the power. See, you don't, you don't talk about earthly power like that. Exceeding greatness. Great. See, there's no nuclear power that is exceeding great. That means that there's no end to it. It just keeps on going. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's like an atomic explosion keeps getting bigger and bigger, but finally it, it tapers off. See, if, a, if an A-bomb or a hydrogen bomb, see, if your nuclear, nuclear bomb was exploded over Joplin, the waves of it would ripple out quite a way away from here, but pretty soon they'd dissipate. And but God's power doesn't dissipate. Amen. It's just exceeding, Amen. great, keeps on getting bigger. So if your view of God is getting smaller, see, now you know, oh, I'm, I'm on the wrong track here. If it's getting monotonous, dull, you're getting used to it. Oh, it's church again, you know. Sing a couple of hymns, hear a little sermon. So good to be in church again. Then you know, Lord, I want to see this is bigger than what I'm thinking right now. Amen. God can open your eyes up to see it. Amen. And notice what he said, the exceeding greatness of the power that is toward us. It's for us. It's power devoted to us. Amen. This power is not for Michael, the archangel. Michael, the archangel, oh, I'm, I'm anxious to meet him because his stewardship was a nation of Israel. Brother, how would you like to have a stewardship like that? Huh? He was stood for the people. <laughs> Michael, Gabriel, he announced 
John the Baptist's birth announced Jesus' birth. He was an angel from God's presence. But this power is not for Gabriel. It's not for the other mighty angels that minister to us. The power is just a special, special allotment of power for us. Amen. But here's how it works. Amen. You can only have as much of it as you can perceive. Amen. If you have a little peephole view, you get a little peephole power. That's the way it is. If you can't see it, how grand it is, you will not take on anything very challenging. Amen. Because frankly, the world's intimidating if you don't see how great God is. Amen. You remember, do you not, when David went down to visit his brothers, took them to lunch down there, some cheese and some things? He come down in the valley. Boy, there was a, they were really intimidated. This giant down there, between nine and ten feet tall, great big fellow lumbers out there. His the head on his spear weighed about 18 pounds. And he'd come out there, and he had a man, just one man, had to push a shield before him, shield there. And he comes out, he challenges the army of Israel, he says, here's it, we'll do, send one of your men out, fight me, and whoever wins, the, wins for the whole group. Boy, oh, nobody volunteered for Israel. David comes on the scene. And while he's there, by the providence of God, Goliath comes out. Now, you will note, if you read the account, that David never did say, whoa, do you see how big that guy is? Never said that. He didn't look at Goliath and say, what a spear! What he said was, he saw, he was not intimidated by this because he knew something about God. He knew more about God than his brothers did, who were older than him. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's defiling the armies of God? Amen. And he, he took him out. Why? Because he was stronger? Oh no, he couldn't even wear King Saul's armor. It wasn't because he had more physical strength. It wasn't because he was shrewd, knew how to maneuver and battle and outmaneuver Goliath. It's because he knew God. He knew the greatness of the power. Now there are some mighty challenges, folk, in our generation, believe me. Mighty challenges we are facing. That if you do not know the greatness of God's power, they'll intimidate you and you'll back down. And you'll be afraid. But if you know God's power, you can face anybody. Or anything. Amen. Whether it's personal, just, just something personal you're facing, Amen. a matter of Satan trying to throw your past up to you, say, he can do that. He can take your past and just throw it up to you. Just beat you down to the ground. Amen. But if you know the exceeding greatness of the power that's for you, you can beat him down. Amen. I'd better beat him. If someone's going to go down, let it be him. Besides that, he's already got a big bruise on his head. <laughs> you might know the exceeding greatness of the power that's for us. But what does power do? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. There it is. Resurrection power. Amen. Now Paul saw this. Paul saw more than most men have seen. But actually he didn't see any more than all men can see. If they want it. Amen. It's available. God has opened heaven for whoever wants to come to him. He has given a promise to his son. Whoever comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. I'm not doing it. And press right up there close. Paul saw this. He said, the things that were given to me, I count lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Yea, and I do count Amen. them but dumb refuse garbage. <laughs> Manure. That's what it is. Amen. Garbage. I don't want it. Why did you do that, Paul? Why did you dump your religious career over? If you don't belong to some of our churches, Paul, you have a reason like this, and I want to stay in there. And I'll bring the rest of the Pharisees to Christ. Huh? Mm -hmm. Is that what he said? He got out of there. Amen. I mean, you don't want to be where God isn't. Amen. He got out of there. But then he tells you why. It wasn't because he was sectarian and looking down his nose at these people. That isn't why. It's because you have to get out of certain kinds of environments if you're going to get hold of God. Amen. So he said, I counted that loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count them but done that I might know him. And the fellowship of his sufferings. And the power of his resurrection. Amen. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and he said, uh, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. He didn't mean that some folk are going to be raised and some not. He meant when the dead are raised, I want it to be a plus, not a minus. Amen. Some folk are going to be raised from the dead to everlasting condemnation. But, yeah. but those that have the power of the resurrection will be raised from the dead to live on forevermore. And that will be the beginning of the good stuff and all the bad stuff. I mean, Amen. think about it. When you're raised from the dead. All, of the, all the things you put in your heart and mind in the Word of God. 
And sometimes you forget it now. That's because we've got this fleshly body and a nature of flesh we're wrestling against. But in the resurrection, can you imagine all that falling together and seeing it all? The investment you made in your heart, in your Amen. mind, is going to pay off. Yes. Big dividends in the resurrection. All right. I want to attain to the resurrection of the dead. And to do it, I need the power of the resurrection now. Amen. Well, don't forfeit the power of people. Amen. See, if you're going to save yourself from this underworld generation, you've got to have the power of the resurrection. But to have it, you've got to pay a price. Amen. Yes. That's not a money. It's not that sort of thing. What is you have to let go of the world. Amen. You have to let go of it. Actually, God doesn't ask you to let go of anything except what's going to burn up. Yes. That's all. Yes. He does not ask you to let go of anything that is truly good. Let go of what's going to burn up. Let go of it now, and it won't be bad when it's got <coughs> It won't be bad at all. Resurrection power enables God to work in you. See, Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Amen. What a blessing. Or how about this? Christ dwells in your heart by faith. That, that takes power for something like that to happen. When Christ is raised from the dead, here's what the resurrection power does. It enables you to come back. Yes. Yes. It enables you to recuperate. Yes. To regain lost ground. Amen. That's resurrection power. So if there's a person here tonight saved that has drifted back. We're not going to condemn you. Because some of us drifted back at one time. Yes. Yes. We wandered too. But look at us. We come back. Yes. Yes. How did we come back? Resurrection power. Yes. That's what resurrection power does. It enables re recovery, praise God, from the strength of the devil. So when Jesus rose from the dead, the human race came back. Hope came back. Amen. Faith came back. Here's power to recover and power to survive. Resurrection power. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask you if you need to come back. I, I can do this. No need to be ashamed about this. Even though I understand that there's an element of shame here, but but God can give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. And he can give you beauty for ashes. In fact, this is his great exchange program. So if you felt like I know I've, I've really not been what I ought to be, I could have made a lot more progress than I have. I've been held back more than I should have. And what you do, you bring that to God, and he'll take your handicaps, and he'll exchange them. Yes. He'll say, I'll yes. take that. My son bore that. Yes. I will take that. I will give you the power of the resurrection, and you, this is 2 Timothy 2.26, can recover yourself from the snare of the devil. Yes. Yeah. Because there are no moral prisons that have doors on them. Yeah. Yeah. So you prefer to sing this song of invitation. If you are out of Christ, you've never come into Christ. I don't, I, if I knew everybody, I might not have to say this, but I don't know. I don't know if there's some of you that have never really put on Christ, but been baptized into him. If you never have, you can do that tonight. If you have, but you have not been who you should be, you can. You, now I understand you don't have to come forward and you don't have to say this. I know that. You don't have to go to heaven either. You want to get that? <laughs> but Jesus died for you publicly, and He does something special for people that publicly acknowledge their need of Him. Amen. You do it Amen. publicly, He will give you grace publicly. Amen. Yes. And he will give you, beside it, there'll be other people that may not know you need grace. And when they know it, they'll, they'll use the grace they have, they have received to help you on your way. So those Amen. are the two things I'm asking you. If there's anyone here that needs to come forward and do this, to do it as we begin to <coughs>